The following message was recorded live at Crossroads Church, a grace-centered community in central Alberta. Just, just yell. That would be awesome. But let's. Well, I, since you know, I got some time here. We'll do some announcements. How's that? No. Two, two key events happened this week. I don't know if you're aware. One is that the uh, Oilers made first place in the division. Uh, this, also that uh, the Canucks did not make the playoffs. <laughs> and on a related note, Dan was rendered speechless. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's not feeling well. The doctor said once he stops yelling at the TV, he'll probably get his voice back. <laughs> but he actually, uh, he's not doing well. So I thought I'd fill in for him and see how this goes today. So... Uh, Hopefully have a great time together as we look at Mark chapter four. Test, test. Test, I'm gonna try switching. Good. Nothing, eh? Gone. Well, that's not good. Thanks. We'll see what happens next. This is exciting, Dan. Thank you so much for watching at home. I appreciate it. This is gonna be a good time. I think we need prayer. Let's open in a word of prayer. Let's try that. Let's do this. So you can turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, 14, sorry, chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 34. But let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to gather here um, with your people. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to look into your word. That we can come before it, we can... Uh, place ourselves in your story. We can allow your spirit today to open our hearts up to engage what you have for us. I thank you that you love us, that you accept us today where we're at, but I thank you that you love us more so that we won't have to stay the same. So we pray today as we come before you that you would begin to transform and work in our hearts. Would you do something for us today? Would you just develop us and shape us to trust you a little bit more than we do today. Look forward to this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to read to you, so I'm going to do that with great difficulty. Mark chapter 14. Right after the Passover meal, with the disciples. They, they head out. And so it starts in verse 32, actually. They went to the Olive Garden called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, can you sit here for a while? I'm gonna go and pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So he went on a little further and he fell to the ground and he prayed that if it was possible that the awful hour awaiting him might pass by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and he found the disciples asleep. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not be given into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So then Jesus left them again and he prayed the same prayer as before. And then he returned to them again and he found them sleeping. They couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But no, the time has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Let's get up and be going. Look, my betrayer is here. 
And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of armed men with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law and the elders. The traitor Judas, Judas had given them this prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. And then you'll be able to take him away under guard. So as soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Then the others, they grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus, he pulled out a sword and struck the high priest's servant slave, slashing his ear. But Jesus asked them, am I some kind of dangerous revolutionary that you would come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. Then all of his disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. And when the mob tried to grab onto him, he slipped out of it and he ran away naked. I was looking at this passage of scripture this week and so many questions come to mind. And so I'm not sure what Dan was gonna do with this passage or what questions were coming to his mind. But many different ones are popping into mind like, you know, why did Jesus choose to go to the Mount Olives after supper? Why didn't he just stay there? Or, you know, why couldn't the disciples just stay awake? How hard was it? What was going on? And then why was Jesus in such anguish and despair? I mean, even to the point of saying that he was in such despair that he felt like he was going to die right there in the garden. And what was this cup that he was talking to the Father about? Like, what was he asking the Father to take away? I think answering some of these questions become very helpful for us as we're going to look at them together. And hopefully from that, we'll, we'll gain some insights into this passage, but also more importantly, that we'll begin to understand how we can maybe step into this story a bit and apply some truths into our life. I want to give you a little bit of context of this passage of where this took place. This place was in the Mount of Olives, where of course then there was olive trees where there was presses to get the olive oil from. These trees are, are very large and it's amazing that these trees are very hardy and there's trees in this region today, actually. They're still there. This is an actual place. You can go to the Mount of Olives today and this is my little side note. I get to go there this year. I'm super jazzed about that in October and uh, it's a trip. We're gonna go to, we get to go to e Egypt and then we're gonna go to Israel and we get to go actually into the Mount of Olives and see these olive trees and uh, you're invited to come. Um, might be a little cramped, but actually I have some information at the back table. If you do want to come, I get to host the trip. So if you're interested in coming along, uh, you're welcome to do so, just not all of you at once. Um, but we get to go there and, and see this, this place that Jesus spent this amazing night at. And these trees in this region are 2,000 to 3,000 years old. They imagine that they can actually resist fire and floods and all kinds of droughts and that they just last forever. And this was a, a favorite place that Jesus went to. I want to give you another picture of where, where this is. If you, if you look on the, the screen, I want to show you that it, this is a, a view from the, the south of, of the city of David looking up. And so the cities on the, uh, the central valley piece is where the city starts kind of over to the left. And you're looking from the Herod's palace up towards, and at the very top where it says Mount Moriah, that's where the temple would start. And then there was this, this kind of gorge that goes down called the Gid, Gidron Valley. And John records that they had to cross through the Gidron Valley actually to get up to the other side, which is where the Mount of Olives would be. So you can see there's kind of an outline of where the temple would be. The, there's Jerusalem there. And then there's this gorge that kind of cuts through along the temple. And then up this other side towards Bethany is the Mount of Olives. And they figured the garden is just somewhere on that hillside where all these large trees still are. 
The reason I, I tell you all that is it's, it's never a throwaway line when you look at Scripture and that he had to cross through. And, and this valley is one of those situations that um, in, in every large metropolis area, it becomes a place where the water goes to. And so it becomes this, uh, in rainy seasons, it starts to, of course, run quite frequently. But at the top of this area is where the, the garbage dump would be. And in the valley is where uh, all the refuge and all the junk and all the runoff of everything else would go. In fact, in this valley is where all the tombs are. And this is where, because all the, the dead bodies and dead animals weren't allowed to stay in the holy city, they would drag them out and they'd put them in the valley. And there's where all the tombs are and where they think also the, the tombs of uh, Jesus, would be, Jesus would be found there as well. So in this time, though, you got to understand, this is Thursday night. This is right after the Passover. And what was happening is at the temple at this time, there was hundreds, this is not exaggeration, I, I looked it up, it's hard to comprehend, hundreds of thousands of animal sacrifices going on. For all the people in the whole area, every Jew would have to come there and present their animal and it would be sacrificed. And so part of the temple system had a kind of this runoff that would run out of the temple and it would run down into this valley. And so it was, Kidron Valley is, is basically named for um, black water. And so you can imagine that this Thursday evening when they crossed through the valley to get up the other side, what they would be crossing through. Basically a river of blood. And so you can imagine Jesus' anguish. He's just done the Passover where he's telling his disciples that his blood will be shed for the sins of many. That this is a new covenant. That he is a sacrificial lamb. He will die for them. And then he has to walk through the valley where to smell a stench of blood and death. And then walking through the tombs where the dead people would be to get up to the Mount of Olives. You can imagine his grief. No wonder he was so distressed by the time he got there fully aware of what was coming only in a short hour or so. And so we can understand why he was in such deep turmoil. Well, why did he go to the Mount of Olives? It was interesting. This was a place that actually he went to on a regular basis. He loved going away in solitary places to meet with his father. And so... I was, I was reading about this passage and, and most people would say things like, this was an extraordinary time and place. And it, and it truly was. This moment was a moment where Jesus was facing the, the last option, I guess, to whether he was going to surrender to the Father's will or whether he was going to kind of cut and run like the disciples did. Would he face what the Father was placed before him? Would he go through with it? His whole ministry was leading up to this place and he had been tempted times before that he would, he would abandon what the Father wanted and he would look out for himself. And in Matthew chapter four, we see that Jesus was tempted by the devil in this situation where he could actually inherit the kingdoms of the world and not go the way of the cross. But I don't think that was a one-off temptation. I think this was a constant thing that Satan plagued them with. A constant taunting of, do you realize what you're about to do? And in this moment, it would be no different where he's understanding fully the suffering that was about to come. So it was an extraordinary event and time in all of history. And at the same time, the reason he went there was because it was very an ordinary thing for him to do. All the Gospels record this time frame, this part of Jesus' life when he's in the garden. And from them, we, we gleam other information. One, it says that Judas actually knew exactly where to find Jesus. They didn't have to scour looking for him. Even though he left where the meal was, Judas left the meal and went off to betray him. And where, did, where would Judas take these people to find him? He knew where Jesus would be. He would be on the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus goes to meet with his father. So although this was an extraordinary moment, it was actually very ordinary as well. It was something that Jesus did on a regular basis. As we look through scripture, we find many, many times in, in, in Luke, for example, or Luke 5, 16 says, Jesus often withdrew to the wildernesses, the times away from the people for prayer. 
It says in Luke 21 right before this that every day when Jesus was in the temple, when he even said, I've been in the temple every day, Luke records that each night he didn't go back to his house, but he would go and spend time at the Mount of Olives. So although this was an extraordinary day, it was actually also an ordinary way that Jesus lived every day. I think this is why maybe the disciples were kind of tired and they were kind of always missing the moment, you know, like they, Jesus would talk and tell them and explain what was coming and you'd be betrayed and he was going to have to die for them. And they would kind of look at him, I think with glazed eyes and go, okay. And, you know, so they're heading off to the Mount of Olives. And for them, this was just a normal part of every day. This is what Jesus did. And, and sometimes he would invite them to go with. And so they would go closer. And sometimes he'd invite just a few to come closer. But they were used to this. This was a normal thing. And for them, you know, even though Jesus told them to stay awake, that he needed them. That in this moment, that Jesus actually needed them to be with him. But I'm sure they thought, well, we're here. I mean, it's, we're close. I mean, we'll just sleep a little bit. Jesus, you know, you go on a long time in this prayer thing, you know, like, you know, we're, we'll come close, but we're just going to rest for a little bit. And so for them, this, they didn't quite understand. This was just something they'd done over and over again. And, and but Luke records that there was a, this was unique in that something about this anguish and despair of Jesus, that this moment was so great that it even says his blood vessels, the, the blood and the sweat was mixing and dropping from his face. That's the level of anguish that Jesus was under. And it, this picture is really hard to grasp, isn't it? It's hard to understand. Because the truth is we have to look at this and we have to see something we're not used to seeing and that is this, the weakness of Jesus. Jesus, fully God, was also fully man. And I find I often kind of, I have a hard time seeing Jesus as weak. And, and, and even that he goes back to his disciples and he pleads them to, please, can you stay awake? Can you just be close? His loneliness, his despair, his grief was real. He was at his weakest point. It is the picture of humanity and really its fullness. You see the humanity in the disciples that even though they wanted to stay awake for Jesus, they just couldn't. Their spirits were willing, their desire was there, but their, their flesh was weak and they couldn't do it. And we see weakness in them. We see weakness in them when, when the moment comes, when they had their chance to stand up for Jesus. When they had their moments, they, they turn and they fled. And even though it says Peter in one of the other gospels was the one that took the sword out, and he was confident in this moment, but in the next moment when he was called to account, are you one of his followers? Three times. He denied it. He wasn't strong when Jesus needed him to be strong. He denied him three times and fled and ran for his life. So Gethsemane, we see a picture of weakness. We see what it looks like to be weak and find strength through the Father. Or we see what it looks like to be weak, try to do it on our own strength, pull the sword, do what we can in that moment, but ultimately in our own strength, humanity will always fail. And so Jesus shows us a picture of weakness, but he shows us a picture of what it always looked like for him when he needed wisdom, when he needed to understand the Father, when he needed to know which way to go next, which path to take, what direction, when he needed uh, greater strength, he would go to his Father. And he was able to get that in this way. Well, what was it that made this such a strong moment for Jesus? When we talk about what was going to happen, Jesus understood what the prophecies said about him. Some of them fulfilled in this very moment. And so I want to read to you a little bit from Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 verses three says, so he was despised and he was rejected. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. 
And so we get a picture of him here, full of grief. It says that we turned our backs on him and we looked the other way. So what his disciples did, they, they took off and he's in, the, he's in the moment of experience when Isaiah said what happened to him, fully aware, and he knows it was the Lord's plan that the Father would crush him and cause him much grief. And this is what was coming. It says in verse 4 to 6, it was our weaknesses that he carried in those moments. He was weak, but he was actually carrying our weaknesses, our frailty. He was carrying our humanity. It was our sorrows. It was the things that have hurt us, that have taken us out in life that actually weighed him down. He was pierced for our rebellion because we ran because we haven't been bold, because we have denied him, because we haven't followed him, because we haven't submitted our will to him. He was pierced for that, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. The Lord laid on him the sins of us all. This is what Jesus was referring to about the hour that was coming. And refers to the cup. The cup would be, what in scripture talks about God's wrath in a form of a cup being poured out. And in that cup, in the sense of what Jesus was asked to drink from, to partake of, to enter into, to participate was that he was going to partake of God's wrath for our sake. In that cup, in that cup, it means that everything that was supposed to come to you and everything that was supposed to come to me, all of our rebellion, all of our sin, all the justice that would have to be made one day would be put into this cup that Jesus would have to choose to drink from. I think sometimes we wonder why, why did Jesus go through such brutality? Why did they torture him so badly? If you ever watched The Passion of the Christ, you remember those horrific scenes, but that was very, very real. That's what they did. That's a normal deal for the Roman, the way they would torture people before death. Why would Jesus have to face that? I tell you why. Because you and I both know that if there is a God, then that demands that he's a just God. And sometimes we have a hard time looking in the mirror in our own life and saying, I deserve that. But we don't have a hard time looking around the world, do we? And if you look at the news at all for very long today, you'll find people out there that you just want to cry out that justice is done. Maybe there's someone in your own life who's hurt you, who's betrayed you in a deep, powerful way, who's abused you, who's let you down, and you wish that justice would be done there. The justice that that person deserves is in the cup. The justice for ISIS and for those that are beheading people, for those that are burning people in cages, for those that are slaughtering children, the justice that those people are due was all going to be placed into this cup that the Father was placing for Jesus and saying, will you enter into this on their behalf? So you can think of the most vilest person out there today. And I guarantee if you were there and you watched what Jesus went through, you watched the torture and the betrayal and the rejection and the whipping and the beating and the crucifixion and the death, you would have to cry out, it's enough. It's enough. No one could endure that anymore. And whatever they have done, that is enough. It had to be enough for all and anyone who would come. Jesus knew that. God is a just God. He said, if you sin against him, you surely will die. Jesus was willing to partake of the wrath of God in your place and in my place. The Bible talks about those that choose not to identify with Christ. The wrath is still coming. But if you place what you did, what your life, what you deserve, and you're willing to identify with what Christ did for you on the cross, you're willing to say, thank you for paying what I deserved and 
placing yourself in that cup. We see in this moment that Jesus was full of sorrow. I mean, this is not something, he understood what needed to happen. He understood what justice needed to take place. And so although he was torn, although it was not something that he was looking forward to do, that he just skipped along doing, he fully understood it. He brought his humanity, his weakness to the table, and he fell before his father because in his weakness, there's no way that he could handle this. So he did as he'd done every day. Whenever he felt weak, whenever he needed strength, whenever he needed direction, whenever he needed to surrender the Father's will, he just placed himself before the Father and wrestled until the Father renewed his strength to continue on the journey. And so that is what he did. We'll learn more about that as we go through the Easter season. Jesus was tempted to look out for himself, to deny what God had planned for him. This is what every temptation always is for us, isn't it? That we would choose our own way rather than accept what God has placed before us. So my question as I wrestled with this text is simply what is before you today? What is before you then is something you wish just wasn't there? What is something that you struggle with? Is it loneliness? Is it depression? Is it an illness? Is it a situation? Is it a love for someone that won't return the love back? Is it a lost friend or family member who won't return? Is it a strained relationship or a terminal illness? What is in your cup? What will you do with that? Jesus was teaching his disciples, see, this was an ordinary day. Because I think what he taught them was in the Lord's prayer, he said, you know what you need to do is you need to come before my father and you need to cry out, Abba, Father. You need to relate to him in a personal way. This is how you engage the father whenever you need to come before him. As you come and you pray, this is how you pray. You engage him and you always come to him and you acknowledge who he is and you acknowledge your relationship that this is your dad. This is the one who is in control. You acknowledge who he is. Next, you acknowledge that he has a will. You acknowledge that he has a plan, that he's in control, that there's a will in heaven. And you submit to that and you ask God that his will that is in heaven would be made known to you, that you may walk in obedience throughout your day. This was a rhythm that Jesus lived out every day. How did he get through this extraordinary day? was because he was well-practiced in the everyday. Whereas the disciples, they kind of watched Jesus at this. They watched this thing, but they, they weren't practiced until Jesus come back to him and say, you too need to watch and pray. You need to go to the Father. You need to bring your stuff or you will fail. And so when he come back to them, they're sleeping. And sure enough, in the moment when what was placed before them was a great cost, a great temptation that they would count the cost of following Jesus or would they turn around and run for it at risk because of fear for their lives? What would they do when that moment came for them? And so for each of us, these are the moments that will come. The moments of will I deny myself? Will I follow Jesus even through this hard time, even through this moment that I don't want, I didn't ask for, I want it to be gone out of my life, I don't want it here, I want him to take it. What will your decision be? I don't think we can expect to have victory in those intense moments when we intersect and when those moments happen if we're not well practiced in the everyday surrender and submission of being with the Father. Are you practicing in the ordinary day? Engaging with the Father. Acknowledging Him in relationship. Acknowledging Him that He has a will and He has a plan for you. 
and submitting in the little things every day. Because when the moment comes and temptation comes and the hour comes, when you come to a crisis, I don't think in our humanity we will have the strength unless we've learned to draw strength from our Father. This is what I put on there. I think in times of extraordinary obedience to God in times of great cost comes from a practice in the everyday ordinary practices of surrendering to God. But what happens to us so often is we only run to God in the extraordinary times. We run to God when we get the diagnosis. We run to God when the marriage is just completely falling apart. We run to God when we finally lose everything. We run to God in our greatest moments of despair and anguish and grief. We run to God in these times for sure, but we come there not practiced, not knowing how to engage Him, not knowing how to pray, not knowing how to be honest, not knowing how to be real and open before Him, not knowing how to wrestle with God in order to renew our strength that we might pick ourselves up and go forward in obedience. We cannot expect victory in the extraordinary moments of our life if we have not practiced in the ordinary. So for some of you, maybe you're in extraordinary right now and you're feeling like Jesus and you're overwhelmed and you're in despair and you're alone and you need to know that you can see his example. You need to throw yourself to the Father and he will hear you. He will listen. He will strengthen you. He will encourage you. He'll lift you up. It's amazing that in this, in this passage, John records at the end of this, when he gets up, and he gets up from prayer and it says that the crowd was there and they were trying to find Jesus. Jesus stepped forward out of the crowd and said, who are you looking for? Jesus, I am he. I'm right here. And the disciples tried to fight them off and he said, no, I choose this. I choose this. You do not need to take me with swords. You do not need to take me with clubs. You do not need to take me by force. I enter into this willingly. And just moments before, he's crying out to his father, please, would you take it away? What happened? Happened is what happens all the time when you lay yourself before your father and you wrestle out your will against his will. When your allegiance is his, he will strengthen you. He will bind you together. He will make you strong. He will make you able to get through whatever he has the power to put before you. But we must practice in the ordinary to have victory in the extraordinary. There's one other thing that I think God led me to this as I was looking at this passage of scripture that was interesting to me. And that was, Jesus invited his disciples to come with. And what he didn't ask is what we often do, which there's nothing wrong with. So I wanna make sure I clarify that. But he didn't ask them to pray for him. He asked them to be with him. To be with them as he went before his father. And it seems small at first, and so I started reflecting on that. In times of great sadness or grief or despair, of great challenge, in other words, there's something before you or in your life that you don't want there. You wish was taken away. I find it's in those moments it is most difficult to be alone with the Father. What we tend to do when something happens in our life and crisis comes, and if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, we, we tend to know that prayer is important, but what we tend to do is we tell others to please pray for us. And I think that's fine and that's good and actually we should do that. But the question I had, the question I believe I was asked was this, Sean, you're so easy, you can ask people to pray for you, but do you come before me yourself? Look me in the eye. 
knowing full well that Jesus knew that my Father has the power right now. He could change it. He could move it. He could fix it. He could take it away. He could change everything right now. Jesus said, Father, you could call down angels. You could do amazing works right now. You could change this. I know I don't have to take this if you changed your mind. In our deepest, darkest times, it is the hardest to look the Father in the eye, knowing his nature, all-powerful and all-knowing, that he has allowed this cup of whatever it is in your life to come before you. That's not easy. And we run from it. We tell others to pray for us because we can't look him in the eye. Because we know he could change it, but he's not. And so we stay distant, we stay back. We, we just, maybe he will for someone else. We're not so sure that we're really that loved by him that he cares to talk about it. I was in, I, I do small groups a lot. I really appreciate Jason being here now. Pastor Jason doing that small group side for me, but still run my small groups. What I find small groups are pretty fun. It was always ironic and frustrating to me in every small group we've ever had. You get to the prayer time. You ever been in one of those? And you're like, does anyone have any prayer requests? And someone usually takes out a book or something to write them down. We go around the room and we, we talk about aunts and uncles and faraway distant countries that aren't very personal, to be honest. Not always. But it keeps God at a distance. You know, a guy, go do this for them and do that for them. And if you could fix that, that would be great. And, but it, vi it violates something. Is this, this is, is this a relationship that I'm in? Is this about me? And so I often in those small groups say, you know what, but what about you? Can we, can we narrow prayer requests down to just be about, like, can you ask for prayer for something? And that gets people really wiggly. And that doesn't always go so well where people, no, what, not your uncle and your aunt. I love them too, but like, no, like, what about you? What do you want God do for you? It's not so easy, is it, when someone asks that one? I mean, people come forward for prayer sometimes and I'll look at them and say, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And they say, no, I just want you to pray for me. And say, I know, but what do you want him to say to you, do for you? That's one level. Ramp it up to what Jesus did. Hey, I want you to gather around me. And I'm gonna pray to my father and I just want you to be with me. I need you. I need you to be here because I'm lonely. I'm in despair. I don't know what's gonna happen next. It's not good, but I'm gonna cry out to my father and I want you to be awake and I want you to be close to me. Wow. I tried that once in a group. I think we should do it all the time. But it was really scary because I didn't tell them it was happening until I said, everyone, I want you to have a prayer request for you. And so they all, they, they swallowed that and they did it. And I said, all right, I just want you to pray for you to your father and we'll be beside you and support you in prayer. And I found out something that's not so easy. It's a very intimate thing. Why do we do that? I think the call today for us from this passage of scripture, scripture is simply the Father saying, I know what's before you. I know what I've allowed in your life right now. Fully aware, fully capable. Will you come and talk to me about it? Well, you just come and wrestle with me on it. Tell me how you really feel. The amazing part about this story in Gethsemane is it allows us to be real. We look at Jesus and here he is wrestling, calling out to the Father, I want you to fix it. I want you to change it. I'm not happy about it. He allows us to be full of despair and loneliness that we don't have to suppress these things, that this is what he said to his disciples. I feel like I'm gonna die I can't take it, but I know the source to go. And so the question is, will you go? 
The father wants to know, will you come? Will you spend time with him to renew your strength? And maybe he'll take the cup away. Maybe he will. I'm so glad that he didn't from Jesus. Because if Jesus hadn't partake of that cup, that would mean that I had to. So a follower of Jesus Christ, we give thanks. We celebrate what this means, that Jesus would willingly step forward and take our wrath on our behalf. It's a lonely place and it's a lonely cup. Only he could decide that. And your life's the same. And you know what? You might have friends around you and you're hoping they'll pray for you and they're hoping they'll be with you and they might just fall asleep and let you down too. But the father wants to know, but will you come? Will you take time in your life to come to me, to talk about what's going on? We'll wrestle it out. It's okay. He's big enough. He understands it. He gets it. He's allowed it. He's put it there. He has the power to change it. Will you come? Because if he doesn't take it away, what he will do, he did for Jesus. He will give you strength to get through it. Let us pray as we close. Heavenly Father, I'm aware. I know there's significant things in this audience. I'm not saying these are small. They don't compare to the cup you drank, that's for sure, that you did for us. But Heavenly Father, significant things that you've allowed in people's lives that sit before them today that they cry out, they want removed. And we know, we acknowledge who you are. We know you can remove them. We know you can fix and solve them. But Heavenly Father, what you want more than any of that is that we would come and know your heart. And so whether you remove it or whether you don't, your deepest desire is that we would engage you because of it. I pray that you would encourage us, you would embolden us to come to look you in the eye today and talk about what's before us that we wish was not there. Would you give us the strength that you gave your son to surrender our desires, to surrender our best interests for ourselves, that you would surrender, we would surrender our will and submit that your purposes would be made known through our lives today. Although we don't want to walk through it, I thank you today that you will see us through. Jesus' name, amen.